You may not be able to see the raised hand once I share my screen as easily. And my PowerPoint is not responding. Come on, PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, can everybody see the, the PowerPoint? No. No. Would it help if we took ourselves off video? Maybe. It might help. It wouldn't hurt. Does anybody see it? Not yet. <laughs> it just says that you're sharing your screen. Oh, there it is. It just showed up. There it is. Yay. Yay. Okay, we'll go slow. And hopefully the it'll keep up. There's no video at least, so that's something. Um, okay, so uh, first we're gonna, this is just kind of the things we're gonna go through. We're gonna troll through a few different kinds of fabrics that are good for memorabilia quilts, neckties, different types of clothing, um, crocheted and other textiles um, that are historical in nature, um, embroidery and um, hankies or handkerchiefs. We'll uh, talk about how to stabilize different fabrics um, some special cases, um, wear and holes and things like that. Um, what a modern memory quilt would maybe look like. Um, and then also cover some resources, which I think the resources were sent out ahead of time for all of you. Uh, neckties are where we're gonna start. And those are really, if, you're, if you've got men in your life that, that wear ties or have worn ties, they're a great way to um, a great thing to use to, to remember that person. I've made a few necktie projects. Um, Susie is on here and I, I snagged one of her photos um, as an example too. Um, and there you could just do so much with them. The one drawback to neckties that I would share is that they're a lot of work. You have to deconstruct the ties you have to line and interface the ties, you have to, um, and then cut your pieces. So they are a little bit more prep work, um, but if you have good memories with them, they're you know, a really, really good piece of memorabilia to use. So here's a detailed how-to. Um, and this is something, if you guys want the details after the fact, we can send out this, this slide as well. Um, you're gonna wanna sort the ties by fiber content, content. So are they natural, like a silk tie or a synthetic, like a polyester tie? Um, and usually the ties have a label that will tell you that. And then you wanna deconstruct the tie. And this is the ripper and you sit. Okay, we are frozen. We lost Heather there. Yep, it looks like we're kind of frozen. Heather, you're frozen. Let me see if... All right, it seems like, um, I'm not sure if Heather's hopped off to try and get restarted or what. So anyway, while, while we're waiting for Heather to come back up, um, I know I um, have done a lot of work with neckties as well. Um, and you know, it never fails. You don't have quite enough for a project. So. I had really good luck going to like the Goodwill, DAV, um, secondhand stores, that kind of thing to find um, neckties to work with. So, and I'm one of those people, you know, I like to wash everything in the washing machine. And so um, just threw a bunch of them in there and washed them. And there was one that didn't come out very good. It was just kind of 
I don't know, fell apart and was kind of a mess. So I decided, well, that was one way to determine which ones you want to keep and which ones you want to get rid of, right? So anyway, but yeah, sometimes you kind of have to, you know, add in a few more neckties uh, to a project. So that's a great place to look for them. Sometimes you can get them like for a dollar a piece or even less. So um, works really well. I see Mary Pacey is with us now. Yay. Welcome, Mary. Denise, I'm texting Heather to see what's going on. Okay. Janie. I do have the PowerPoint. Maybe I should pull it up. I just thought of that. Sorry, guys. Um, While you do that, Denise, can I show the, the quilt gift yeah. lady my bullseye? Please do. That would be great. Okay. I was late in getting on here tonight. I wanted to do it before, but I did take your bullseye patterns and ideas and I made a table runner. Wow. Good for you. I'll show up one of them up close. I love your fabric. So I thank you very much for last month's lesson. You're welcome. I really like it. I can always count on you trying what we show each month. <laughs> You're our go-to person. Oh, I really, yeah, I really like this. I'm going to send it up to my daughter because it's got Minnesota fabric in it. But um, I really liked it. I washed it twice, and I love how it turned out. Oh. Hey guys, I'm back. I had to flip over to my other computer for some reason. Okay. I don't know why, but my whole PC just froze up on me. <laughs> well, we've been inter entertaining ourselves, so. <laughs> okay, good. How far did I get before I froze up? Um, you were starting to talk about neckties and deconstructing and that sort of thing, so. Okay, well, here, let me see if I can share from this. I just flipped over to my other computer that <laughs> doesn't have as good of a background behind me, but um, let me try to share this screen and see if this works better. Yeah, you're there. Whoops, it was there. Does, does that work better? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Um, so is this about where we were? Yep, okay. that's where we were. I'm gonna grab my chair and slide over to my other spot here. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, Mary, actually, I think I saw Mary Pacey is on and she helped put together yeah. uh, these instructions. You see piles of ties from a project that I made, um, but this is actually Mary's instructions. If you wanted to pipe in Mary, I know you washed your ties, which I did not do. Um, the ties that I were working with were for a friend and she didn't want me washing them, um, but you do have to pick all your seams, um, which takes some time. And uh, Mary said, if you're going to wash them, to make sure to leave that lining on the point of the tie so that um, you can, when you're washing, it doesn't, it doesn't come apart quite as, as bad. Um, and then for the washing, you, you really need to make sure that you keep your, your silk especially the red silk ties separate because um, they're gonna release a lot of dye when you're washing them. And then you rinse them and you don't dry them. You roll them up in a towel and squeeze all the water out. Um, and then you're gonna press them. And I noticed when I was pressing ties and maybe it's because I didn't wash them, um, they put off a lot of fumes. Um, they, you know, so they, they were just very, very stinky. Um, but I mean, so just make sure you're in an, you know, a kind of an open air environment or you take some breaks if yours also gets stinky. Uh, then you're going to want to add some interfacing to the back side, And this is to stabilize them because a tie is not like your normal quilting cottons. It's going to stretch and bend. Um, and they're, they're a little difficult to work with until you put that interfacing on them. Once you have the interfacing on, then you can cut your patterns. And you can see in that top left picture, um, I had actually cut my interfacing pieces pretty close to what I wanted my actual Dresden 
diamonds to be cut. And that was so that I could kind of maximize. And you can see I'm trying to get two pieces of Dresden off of each necktie there. And that was just a little bit to help me line up and figure out where I needed to put the interfacing at. Um, let me go to the next slide. This is the finished version of the quilt that, that I was making in those previous photos. And a Dresden's a nice um, pattern with neckties because when you're done, they look like neckties. Um, so it almost looks like you put the necktie back together. And then this is a quilt that Mary made. Um, and she, I'm not, I don't think she used Dresden's, but again, she flattened them out and stabilized them and then pieced them back together to look like neckties. Heather, that was in the modern quilt book. Okay. So that's one of the resources that we have at the end. I would have grabbed that to hang on to it, but I, the library made me give it back. We found this great um, modern quilt, uh, modern memorabilia quilt book, and it's on the reference page that you all have. Um, and it's at the Johnson County Library, but there's only one copy. This is a pillow that you made. And Mary, were these Dresdens that you used in this pillow? Yes, it was a table topper of my dad's ties. And then you use the ties for the binding pieces and you stabilize those, I'm assuming, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And then this is uh, my friend, uh, Susie Anderson, and she's actually on here tonight. She's made a number of projects with uh, ties and she's foundation pieced them all. So a couple different looks and you can see um, she used the tie labels there um, in the top left corner. And you can see the back side where the, the um, paper from the paper piecing still is as well. You can use other types of clothing as well. Um, you need to know when you're diving in, is your, is your piece of fabric a knit or a woven? And the big thing there is that a knit fabric requires stabilization. So a knit fabric is t-shirts, uh, jersey, pajamas, sweatshirts, anything athletic wear. When you look at it, you'll see these tiny little V's. And so my sweatshirt that I'm wearing today is knit. And I mean, you, when you stretch it, it stretches. But I can also look up close and I can see all those little teeny tiny V's from when it was uh, knit on the manufacturing line. A woven fabric does not require any stabilization. But if you're stabilizing all your other fabrics, it doesn't hurt to add it, just so that they all have a similar consistency to them. Um, those are gonna include a lot of uh, traditional dresses, men's dress shirts are generally woven. They're gonna have very little stretch and they're gonna feel like your quilting cottons that you're used to. Uh, this is a, uh, some different views of traditional t-shirt quilts. They're pretty simple to do. Again, though, you do need to stabilize them. And we'll talk later about different ways to stabilize. The, the most common is a fusible, an iron-on stabilizer, which is what we suggested for the ties as well. Um, then you'll cut your pieces, arrange them, and um, sew up and quilt. So these two in the photo here, the, left, the one on the left is um, pieced t-shirts next to t-shirts, and they're all stabilized. And um, it, you know, it takes a little bit more math when you do that, that type of piecing together because you you have to figure out where's my row going to be or my column before you put it all together. So it may not look obvious but there are rows in that quilt um, because none of the verticals line up. Um, the picture on the right is a quilt that I made that actually didn't have any stabilization and um, you can go without stabilizing a, a t-shirt quilt but you, um, this one doesn't show it, but all those t-shirts had sashing around them um, before they were fully pieced. This is pinned up on my design wall. And what that um, sashing does, you use a quilting cotton and that stabilizes it. But if you are not confident working with a knit fabric, um, you need to do some practice before you go and, and start trying it on a t-shirt quilt. Because as stretchy as t-shirts are, it's really, really hard to keep them straight and flat while piecing. Um, and if you have 
plans to tie the quilt, you can get away with a lot more wonkiness than if you have plans to take it to a long arm quilter. Um, some long arm quilters won't even touch a t-shirt quilt that doesn't have stabilization on the back of all the blocks. Um, but you can lay them out a lot of different ways. You can put sashing in between. Um, you can put sashing just where you need to to make the block fit, like in the top left um, example. None of those actually have sashing, but you could add it if you had a, a piece that just didn't quite fit right without it. Let's go to the next one. Um, this is some other fun things that you could do with a, a t-shirt quilt. Um, this one's a little bit more of a traditional layout, although you could see there is some sashing around some, but not all of the t-shirts. But what I wanna bring your attention to is the picture on the right. Um, so what happened there is that um, this was a, a t-shirt quilt that was started by the young lady's mother and her mother passed away before finishing it. So her father gave me all the t-shirt blocks that were started and then asked, can you put something on there from her mom? And so he got me a photo of her um, from a card that the mom had written for the daughter um, with uh, her name and love always. And so I traced that and stitched over it a few times. And so that's something that you can add to personalize really any of your memorabilia. If you go back and you find handwriting um, from the person that the, the fabrics belong to. And so that was, you, you could do little things like that. You can also include special bits of clothing. So if you have a baby um, jumper with, you know, the little metal rings for the suspenders on the overalls, you can include those little metal rings. You can include pockets, um, buttons, things like that to make, make the quilt a little bit more special as well. Um, athletic fabrics technically are a knit, um, but you really have to stabilize an active wear um, fabric in a quilt. So these are two different quilts made with all active wear. Um, and you follow very similar steps to a t-shirt quilt. They're a little bit harder to work with because they're more slippery, but once you stabilize them, um, they're, they're pretty much the same as working with t-shirts. Um, these were both pieced on a long arm. Um, so they're a little bit, the, the one on the right, most definitely you can't see how it all fits together because it didn't fit together in a traditional pieced sense. And then we wanted to talk about um, crocheted items. Janie, did you wanna talk about those? Sure. Um, I first got exposed to the idea of doing uh, doilies or crocheted items onto fabric through a friend of mine who had a huge selection of handmade doilies and she wanted to make a wall hanging out of them. So we started playing around with it. And the it, they're not hard to stitch down onto a background, but it's important that you stabilize the background. I used a Pellon product called SF101. It's an iron-on that I put on the back of the background fabric. And then I pressed the doily so it was laid out and I put some uh, best press on it to kind of make it a little more stiff. You could use a starch if you wanted to. And then I initially took this one and just stitched it down with matching thread. And then I started playing with it and decided that I needed to uh, add to it because it was much too plain. So I think if you go to the next slide. Yes. Uh, I added some uh, little pearl beading on the outside, some decorative stitches. And then in the close up, you can see where I took some metallic thread and started using some decorative stitches along with some straight stitches to um, add additional uh, embellishments to it to make it pop a little more. This is still a work in prog progress, so I'm not sure what's going to happen next, but I'm sure it's going to have more on it before it's done. So they're, they're easy to put down. You don't need a special foot on your sewing machine. Uh, you just need to be patient with it. Uh, next slide. 
I was given a tea towel, as you can see in the small picture, that was very threadbare and was basically uh, falling apart, had holes in it. So I cut the chicken out and I backed it with SF-101 again and I applied it to a towel and it made a really cute towel. And it was a great reuse because the, the embroidery was in fine shape, but the actual material that it's embroidered on needed the, uh, needed the stabilization from the SF-101. And the SF-101 is really fabric. It's a very fine fabric that you iron on. So it stabilized the embroidery for future use. And I have, um, just to jump in here, I grabbed samples of a few different kinds of stabilizers to, to show at the end. So I'll show you guys hopefully um, in person. Yeah, there are a lot so of different speak. kinds of stabilizers that you can use, you're right. Additionally, when you're doing decorative stitches on things, which we can talk with, uh, with the next slide, Heather, um, Anytime you're using a decorative stitch with a, like a lightweight quilting cotton, I use um, a embroidery stabilizer, a nice tearaway stabilizer or uh, a water soluble stabilizer behind the fabric so that the decorative stitches work really well. Um, this is a pin cushion that I put together. This uh, embroidery was from uh, a pillowcase that I cut off. And then the, the crocheted uh, trim around it was also off another set of pillowcases. And I just added some vintage fabrics on the bottom and the left. And then I added the solids and just made a pin cushion out of it. Uh, it's stuffed. I made a little pillow that goes inside of it to make it actually into the pin cushion and it's stuffed, uh, stuffed with crushed walnut shells. So the thing that's nice about taking old vintage hand embroidered linens is you can cut out just small sections and utilize them in a lot of different ways and this is just one method. And then this example is uh, one that I made and I ordered some vintage placemats off of eBay a few years ago. Uh, I have a friend um, in Lawrence who does a lot of work with quilting on vintage textiles in this format. And so I thought I would give it a go. So if you go look on eBay, you can find all sorts of these, but you might also just have them in your linen closet. Um, this was one, and you can see there's there was a lot of holes in the decorative stitching on the outside of the placemat. So I cleaned up the item, I pressed it, and then I chose a solid fabric. Um, satins and silks are great choices for this. Um, I used a um, just a quilting cotton, and then I I did a light spray of the 505 adhesive um, to hold the piece in place. Um, and then I tacked it down with 100 weight thread, which is really, really lightweight thread. So you aren't ever going to see those stitches, but I went around every single nook and cranny in there to make sure that this thing was tacked down around the outside. And then I quilted the interior of it. Um, I haven't finished and trimmed and bound this piece yet. I had it on the wall behind me before I had to flip computers here. And I could show you at the end as well up close. Um, just exactly how all those little points are tacked down. This is Janie again. Um, oh, Jane. Go ahead, Heather. No, I was just going to say this is yours. Um, I What got me into quilting was my mother-in-law gave me 91 hand-stitched Dresden plates that her great aunt made in the 20s or the 30s. We're not really sure. And uh, they were just stitched together and the Dresden plates were, were not on any kind of background. They were just thrown in a bag. And when I got them, they smelled awful and they were yellow and they just looked awful. So the first thing I did was get them appraised because I knew that from the fabrics that they were old. And I was surprised to know that some of them were from the 1890s, some of the pieces. Um, so I took vintage soap, which I thoroughly swear by, 
And I put all these Dresden plates and just soaked them in vintage soak and very carefully rolled them into towels and got them cleaned up. And I was amazed at the change once I got them, got them cleaned up. The colors were very vivid uh, and they just were really pretty. The unfortunate part was that I think they were hand stitched together with twine. <laughs> it was really, really thick thread. So I took them apart and put them back together, machine stitched them together. And that way I could also pull out anything, any fabric pieces that were not good. And there were a few pieces where the uh, die was actually clock, what they call clocking out of the fabric. It's not that it fades out of the fabric, it literally lifts up like in flakes. So I took those pieces out and discarded them. And then again, I uh, stabilized them and made them into grandmother's flowers. So this was the first quilt I ever made and it was quite an adventure to say the least. Um, so this is what got me into quilting, but I I love this quilt. It's It's one of my favorites. Additionally, I had leftover Dresden plates and I wanted to make a quilt for my sister-in-law so that she would have something from her great, great aunt. And this is the quilt that I made out of mm -hmm. uh, the remaining Dresden plates. And it's a little hard to see, it's not the best picture in the world, but part of the uh, fans are uh, the vintage fabric from the Dresden plates. And then of course I just added the, the new 1930s fabric in with it. This is a work in progress. This is a hanky and I've taken it and put it on SF 101 and I'm going to um, embroider it down on the background that it's on. The white that is actually between the purple and the actual hanky there is SF 101 and I'm going to trim all that away and use some decorative stitches. I've also thought about doing some folding techniques um, on this one and use some decorative stitches to kind of change the shape of the interior of the block, but we'll see what happens with that. Anyway, it's, it's kind of an evolution. This next slide is another hanky that I have taken and formed it into a butterfly. And I know that if you go out and you get on Pinterest or Google and look up hankies turned into butterflies, you'll see all kinds of possibilities. This particular hanky had a, uh, a scalloped edge, which I think really lends itself well to doing this. I'm going to do uh, specialty stitches and embroidery for the antenna. I'm not sure exactly what I'm gonna do with it yet, but I'm thinking about taking it off the white background that it's on and putting it on a multi-pieced background and just doing a wall hanging with it. Uh, I have done some additional uh, decorative stitches on the hanky since uh, Heather got this picture. So again, it's another one of those evolving projects, but it is stabilized with SF 101 again. And then this one is Mary's. Mary, did you want to talk about this one from Kinder? Sure. Uh, Kinder made a hanky quilt for each of her two daughters. And uh, when, when I cleaned out mom's hope chest and other things, I found hankies and I said, well, here, do you want some more hankies? And she said, yes. And then uh, one year for Christmas, I come and I said, oh, she had it on the couch. And I said, oh, you made another one. And she said, that's yours. And I said, I didn't make it. She said, no, I made it with your mother's handkerchiefs. Uh, so she, she made this for me. She blanket stitched around, a real tight blanket stitch around each of the handkerchiefs to, to hold them down. I don't think she used any stabilizer. And did Kenda, did she do the whole thing by hand? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know about piecing the blocks together, but at that point she was doing some hand quilting, yes. And then we've got um, some other things that you can do that with, with some of your memories. And this first one is Janie's again. Um, 
in all the multitude of old linens and things that I have inherited from great aunts and mothers and mother-in-laws and friends and others, <laughs> I uh, found these two aprons and these were just basic aprons that they wore in the 1950s and they were reversible and they had pockets on both sides and I took them and put batting between the two layers because they were open around the bottom and I turned them into a bag and used the apron ties as uh, the shoulder uh, strap. I can't think of the word. Shoulder strap. Uh, shoulder strap. So that's that's another option that you've got. I did a little bit of quilting on this. I made these when I first started quilting, and it was it was an interesting prospect to say the least. And then there are other things that you can do as well. Um, on the left is a bear that I actually have here. Um, Susan is my mom, and she's not on tonight. She lives in South Dakota. Uh, but when my second kiddo was a baby, he had to sleep in um, a really tight sleep sack until he was nine or 10 months old, way longer than you should ever have to keep a kid with their arms tied, you know, to their bodies like that. But he could not sleep without it. And so he slept in this sleep sack almost every night for nine months, um, give or take. So when he finally outgrew it, I said, mom, will you make him a bear? Because I can quilt, but I can't make a stuffed animal um I didn't even want to attempt it so she made him a bear out of his sleep sack so um the sleep sack was that striped print with that little rocker dude on it and she even saved the the tag and put that on his belly because little kids just love to play with those tags um, she did put not kid friendly eyeballs on um, but he didn't ever pull them off and choke on them so I think we're okay and he's seven now, he's not going to. Um, and then on the, the other side is um, a project that Mary did. These are, uh, you, when you go online to look for this, um, it's a kit and um, it comes with a pillowcase, you have to embroider it and instructions. You use the, from the, from the top fold down, you use 13 inches to make uh, the body and the clothes except for the the skirt and um you can dress it up any way you want to the pattern did not have a face on it and so i've never put a face on it but if you're artistic you could paint a face or put buttons or whatever this one that you're seeing was um a very very thin pillowcase that was from again from mom's hope chest and uh, I would I'd really advise against it because even just trying to stuff the doll part, the neck seam split. And that's why I had to add lace around the little doll's neck to hide the split. Um, but it, it doesn't take that long to make. The, the kit's real informative in the, in the full size patterns. Um, and then if you've got other memorabilia that you'd love to um, keep, but it's not fabric, you can print that memorabilia. So in this photo here, you can see there's, there's a corner of a, of a photograph, and then there's also um, a recipe handwritten in grandma's handwriting. And so I've, I've made a lot of these for friends. Um, they'll send me photos and they'll send me, you know, recipe cards and, you know, cards with handwriting, you know, Christmas cards and birthday cards and things like that. Um, it, it's really fun. You can design it on your computer um, and then you send it away to Spoonflower. Um, there's a couple other places you can send away to and they will send you a piece of fabric with all of your things on it. So you can either take the photo and have a photo printed onto fabric or you can design the whole quilt. And I tend to design the whole quilt. Um, and then I have it printed on Jersey because Jersey really does make a nice soft quilt. Um, but I wouldn't do a photo on Jersey. I would do the photo on, on traditional quilting cotton if I was going to cut and piece a quilt together with it. Um, but they're fun because you can real quickly and easily make duplicates. 
Um, you can incorporate things like, like the recipes. Um, and you can make duplicates that are just a little bit different. Um, for this particular one, I think I, I think I made three different ones that the only difference was the color of the background. So one was purple and one was red and I think one was green. Uh, but the entire rest of the quilt was the same. And here's some more examples of that. And so the, the center one, the red one, you can see has the, the recipe cards on it. You can also, um, the, the bottom right, um, the one that says class of 2020 on it, is actually spirit shirts for a local school. And um, what's nice about this is nobody had to give up their spirit shirts for us to make an option quilt um, every year. Those are, it looks like a t-shirt quilt is pieced together, but it's really photographs of their spirit shirts that were digitally printed um, all together as one. Okay, stabilizing. I'm gonna pop out here just a second to grab some things from my tables that were closer before I moved to this computer. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so when we talk about stabilizing fabrics, there's a few different ways that we can do that. Um, the traditional way would be to starch them. Um, so you can either spray on starch and iron, or you can dip your clothes into a starch bath and then hang them up. And when they're almost dry, go ahead and iron them. And the nice thing about starch is that it washes out. So you're gonna end up with a lightweight, very soft quilt when you're all done. But it can be messy, it can be time consuming. If you think about having to take all the t-shirts for your t-shirt quilt and giving them a um, starch bath, um, it, just think about how messy that might be. Uh, not all fabrics will end up being stable after you starch them, or you might need to really use a lot of starch. And when we're talking starching, we're not talking best press. And I know Janie used best press to give a, a light starch um, to some things, and that's a good use for it. But if you're, if you're looking to stabilize a t-shirt, best press, and I have some here, this is, this is not gonna cut it. It does a lot of things really great, but it's, it's not gonna be good enough to stabilize something thick like a t-shirt. Um, a starch that you can purchase it's really well respected is Terriel Magic. I haven't used it myself. Um, it's kind of one of those things that I've thought about trying, but just haven't quite jumped into yet. I don't know, Mary or Janie, have you starched many things? Uh, I, I have a tendency to stay away from starch. I use spray starch. That's really my experience with starch. And I haven't used it. Yeah. Uh, if you use, uh, some starches are plant-based, which I think, you know, they, they wash out the best. They're organic. They're real nice, but they can attract bugs. So a potato starch would be um, one of them. They're nice and natural, but you, if you're not quilting your project and working on it to the point where you can wash it quickly, um, you might attract some bugs to your fabrics, and none of us want that. You can also attach a backing. And so those backings fall into a couple of categories, a fusible, which is an iron-on, or a spray. So I'm actually gonna go to the second one first, which is a spray. And this is what I love, it's called 505. And I use this for a number of things. I use it for embroidery with my embroidery machine to hold down a, a top piece. Um, I used it on that um, placemat that I did because I, I there was holes in the placemat. So I didn't really want to have to iron a stabilizer on it and then cut around all those. So this was nice because it's, it, it can go on and it's a temporary adhesive. So you can reposition a little bit. Um, you can also use muslin and I have a bolt of muslin here, but um, you know, muslin is just a really lightweight fabric and you can use that and you can either sew your piece down onto it real lightly um, you can pin baste it, or you can, again, use the 505 to stabilize it. And then there are the fusibles. This is a bolt of featherweight Pellon. It's um, 911FF, and the, the code is there. This is a pretty common one that a lot of people use in t-shirt quilts. It's 
I don't really know how I would explain this. It's not cloth. It's soft and it's, you know, it's got some drape to it, but it, it's, it is fairly thick and it's, it's going to add some thickness to your project. But what you do is you iron this onto the back of your t-shirt and then you cut your t-shirt square out and it, it makes it nice and um, stiff like a woven would be so that you're not going to get a lot of stretch as you sew. And then this is what I know Jamie uses a lot of. It's called Shape Flex 101. And that's made by Pellon as well. And what's nice about it is that it, it is very drapey. It is fabric. It's basically muslin with um, a grippy side to it. And that grippy side is what you iron down. So this has more drape to it. So if you're looking for a softer end product or if you're having to stabilize several layers in order to finish, this is a, a really good product to use. Um, all backings are going to add some weight to your final quilt. Um, I don't know of any that wash out when you're done, like a starch would. Um, if you really, really don't want to stabilize, um, sometimes on t-shirt quilts, I don't, um, but I've also worked with a lot of t-shirts. So you want to make sure that you get comfortable working with the fabric and you want to stabilize it somehow. So, um, I will sometimes use a serger to sew together because a serger, if you have differential feed, will keep those fabrics from stretching. Um, and if you sew a piece of woven all the way around it as a frame, that sashing, it'll hold it nice and, and square for you as you keep going. Um, if you don't have a serger, um, or even if you do, these little things are called sew tights or sew teeth. And they are kind of a newer product that you can go out there and buy. But there's a top and a back. Where's my camera? And they're magnetized. So see here on the back, there's three little magnets. They come in different lengths. Um, there's actually a length that's a little bit longer. And they're nice because they do a really good job of stabilizing that seam. And you can do it with your fabrics flat on your table before moving over to the sewing machine. So they're a little bit they, they work a little bit better than pins um, to, to help piece if you're gonna go without stabilizing. Um, if you have a long armor, you need to make sure that they're okay with you bringing one that's not stabilized. Um, and although I long arm and I don't stabilize all mine, um, I don't know that I personally would take many from a, from a customer because I know that if I make a mistake, I'm the one fixing it. Um, so that's the risk you run. Um, you can also, for like a t-shirt quilt, um, you can tie it, in which case, if it's not stabilized, it's not gonna be nearly as obvious. Or you can sew it front sides together, right sides together, the front and the back without a batting and um, turn it and just top stitch around the edge when you're all done. And then it's a little bit more friendly if all of your blocks aren't perfectly square anymore. Some special cases, if you have some photos, you can print those at home on printable fabric, or you can use uh, one of the websites like I talked about earlier. And the two that I've used a fair amount are Spoonflower and Design Your Fabric. And there you just upload your photos or um, an image that you've created using Photoshop or something like that. Uh, if your fabric is damaged, so a lot of t-shirts, a lot of older textiles have holes in them. You can do things like Janie did with, with her kitchen towel where she cut around just the part that she wanted to keep. But if, you're, if that, there's a hole in the middle of what you want to keep, you have to deal with that somehow. So two, two different ways that I use a lot are either backing them, and I'll use muslin again to back them. So I will spray it onto a piece of muslin and stitch around that hole with a decorative stitch um, or even a straight stitch, but something to stabilize that hole and keep it from getting larger while providing a back behind it. Or you can applique something on top. So depending on where the hole is, you could, you know, you could applique a butterfly or a heart or um, any number of things onto the top of it to again, protect it and hide that hole. 
Um, you can also, if it's a lot of damage, and I've done this a few times, I photograph the item. I've had a few t-shirts come that just aren't worth the effort of backing um, because there's so many holes, but you can photograph the item and then create a new digital print of that. And again, you can print that onto t-shirt jersey so it feels just like the original. Um, if you wanted to make a modern looking quilt, uh, Mary found this book, Modern Memory Quilts by Suzanne Paquette. And that's a really great spot to start. It is available through the library. And she took a lot of quilts where she would take the t-shirts and instead of cutting out the center of the t-shirt like we're used to seeing, she would cut strips out of that t-shirt and make a pieced quilt. So she would take a traditional quilt pattern with, um, you know, uh, different kinds of blocks in it and she would use pieces. So you'd get just a portion of what was on that t-shirt front in each different block. So you could no longer tell that it was from a specific sport or a specific vacation, but you still had all those pieces. So if you wanted to be a little bit more funky with your, your textile, is that something you can do? Um, and, um, you know, cut through those designs. And then this is the resource list that we shared with all of you ahead of time. Um, I zoomed through that really fast, um, but I thought I would share, and then Janie and Mary can share as well on their cameras, anything that they have to share. So this is, and I don't know how well you can see that, the up close of that, that placemat. And so it's stitched down just inside this um, embroidered line that they had on the original placemat. And if you look at the back, um, you, can, you can kind of see that original design as well. Let me see if I can get it in front of the camera here, nice. Um, this is the bear up close. So he's nice and squishy. And then I have a t-shirt quilt here too, but I'm not gonna lift that up because I think you guys all know what that looks like. Janie, did you want to show any of yours up close or? I can't. It's on your wall. Let's see. Let me go to my rear. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing so you guys can see better. see uh, there's a close-up I'm on a mini thing so I'm not sure how well this is going to come across but that is a close-up of the uh, pin cushion that I showed this is the butterfly that I've been working on and I had said that I had added some decorative stitching so I'll show some of that up a little closer so you can kind of see where I'm trying to accent the folds and the edging with the green stitching. Um, this is the chicken on the towel. And you can see that I just left, you know, like a quarter of an inch of the towel so that I could do my stitching there with the white so it really kind of disappeared. Um, this is something I had not shown in the video, but this was a uh, sunbonnet sue that was reversible. And I cut it apart, stabilized it, and I added half of it to a towel and gave it a little extra decoration with the bow and the rickrack and the tatting around the bottom. That's also on a towel. And then this is the uh, bag that I made from the apron. You can see I did a little bit of stitching and quilting, just following the pattern on the piece. So I think that's it. Mary, you got something there too, I can see. Well, yeah, this is a close up of the doll. Um, 
she she does you could put buttons and ribbon and they i just tack the the back of the dress closed um but you can do whatever you want and um i wanted to tell you these little uh ties they they're just the connector blocks you start with a square and then you put a smaller square in the corner corner and diagonal sew and cut them off. So they're real, they were really fast to put together. Um, and I, I thought they were really kind of cute. I always make something the way that they make it the first time. So that's why I used her setting. And I, I wanted to show a block, a book that, that the library doesn't have, um, but I have, and I don't know if you can see all of the different quilt, just traditional quilt patterns that this lady used um, to make this hanging. She was a speaker at, I think, the very first uh, State Quilters Guild meeting uh, back in 1984. And her, her quilt on the title page, I think, is somewhat modern looking. Can I, I know there's a glare, but... Um, and again, you have to hunt and pick your, your ties to make the, the designs that you want. So anyway, that's all. Uh, Heather, there is yes. a book that I have. It's called Worth Doing Twice. And it's by Patricia J. Morris and Jeanette T. Muir. I hadn't thought about it before, but it features taking old quilt tops and... Um, getting them finished or remaking them into um, usable quilts. And it's a really, really good book. I think I found it. I'm not sure where I found it. I may have found it at the Half Price Bookstore. Could you say the title and author again? It's called Worth Doing Twice. Twice. Patricia J. Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S. And Jeanette, J E A N N E T T E, T is in Thomas Muir, M U I R. Thank you. Sure. But that's worth looking into if people are interested in, in dealing with old quilt textiles. Okay, so now we probably, this is a good time to open it up to any questions, Denise. Did you did we ever figure out a chat? I don't think it doesn't look to me like there is one. Yeah, this weird. We don't have a chat, so <clears throat> ask away. How do you find the vintage soap? Where do you find that? Uh, vintage soak, S O A K is what it's called. And if you will Google it, they're, it, they're only selling it directly from the manufacturer now, which is here in the U.S. In fact, I just ordered it not too long ago. Uh, give me a minute. I'll, let me see if I can find uh, the business card I have. Okay. I can ask I can another question up. while you're looking for it. Um, I have some very, very old quilt blocks from a great aunt and she passed away in, I think it was 1955. All of them are done by hand. Mm -hmm. um, so I assume I would follow what was shared about um, the quilt fabrics that were from like the twenties and thirties and maybe earlier. Um, are there any other suggestions that uh, they're not like bright colors and stuff. Some of them, some of them are interesting like these, but then there's some others that are, I don't know, they're not, they're a little more dull colors, but uh, they're still all done by hand. And what I, I want to do something really, really cool with them. I think what you'll find if that you will put them in vintage soak, your colors are going to brighten. I mean, okay. The Dresden plates that I had were all yellow and the colors were dingy. And I just let them soak, which is what you do with them, um, for I think mine soaked for probably 48 hours. 
and then I very gently rinsed them and then got laid them out to dry. I had them all over the place laying out to dry, but that's okay. And the colors really brighten. Additionally, I used uh, Reproduction 30s fabric to uh, do the sashing and the, and the background blocks. So once you get your vintage blocks to where you want to work with them, then you could take them and match colors to uh, new fabric hmm. if you wanted to add sashing, etc. You wouldn't yeah. have to do that. You could just stitch them together. The one thing you may find is you may need to square up your blocks. Yes. Right? Yes. So, challenge. so the, like mine, I this there's going to be a couple quilts out of it, but one of them, they're just like blues and browns. So those are the ones that are, I don't know if I'm going to need to add other colors in between for the sashing to kind of make it pop a little bit or but I don't want to change the style too terribly either. So. Oh, well, I, I understand that. The, the key is they kind of evolve. So okay. in when I did the quilts from the Dresden plates, and I've done a couple other quilts um, <clears throat> for friends, I had one that was another grouping of, of grandmother spans, and every block was a different size. Mm -hmm. And every background was a different kind of muslin. And the first thing I did was cut them apart, square up the blocks. And then this time I just stabilized them. And then I put them together. I figured out what I wanted for sashing and for borders. And I just kind of laid them up on the wall with some fabric on my design wall and said, okay, do I like it? Do I not like it? and then go for it. They evolve. They will tell you what's right once you go through the process. Thank you. I, my last question is, are we able to have um, copies of the slides at the end or is that possible? I'm okay with that. It was a pretty large presentation, but Denise has it if she wants to send it out as long as sure. Mary and Janie are good with that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Thank you. Happy to share. We'll get that That's fine. tomorrow morning. Okay. Are there other questions? I have a question. I want to make a t-shirt quilt, but I've never made one before. So would you suggest that I make like a practice quilt, I guess, since the t-shirt material is kind of difficult to work with? Have you ever made a when, when you say you haven't made one, have you made any quilt? No, I'm a, be I'm a beginner, so. Okay. okay, yes, I would not start with a t-shirt quilt. You don't have to start with a full quilt, um, but definitely make you know a table runner or a little wall hanging, something to get the feel for sewing blocks together before you jump into the, the thing that you really care about. Okay. Something that you're not going to cry if it doesn't work right. Yeah, that's and what I don't want to <laughs> messing up my shirts that I've had. <laughs> so yes, hold on. and it's a lot easier to tear stitches out of quilting cotton than it is t-shirts. Okay, it's a lot easier. The other thing um, when you're doing a t-shirt quilt, um, and let me run over and grab mine. I have a set of rulers that I mm -hmm. like to use that um, come in different sizes. And you can buy just the one size. I mean, look at your shirts and figure out, I mean, if they're all gonna be the same size or different sizes. Um, but I have a set of these. I make enough t-shirt quilts that I have a big set. This is a 12 inch, it's called a 12 inch even up. And okay. so the ruler itself is 12 and a half inches, but you can see the little line here that shows you which, which part of your shirt's gonna show. It shows you the center um, and I have, I have a whole lot of these in different sizes. <laughs> but what's nice about using these is that when you when you go to cut a t-shirt, even after you've stabilized it, it's really hard to get a big giant square mm -hmm. to stay square. Because you cut one side and then you pick up your ruler and you move the t-shirt and then you cut the next side. And then you and before you know it, even with the stabilizer, your t-shirt cut when you're done is no longer square. It's you know some sort of a parallelogram. <laughs> or rhombus 
where you know the sides go out or they come in or they, yeah. whereas with these and you can see on this one I use it a lot I've put little stickies on the mm -hmm. corners yeah they hold the fat they, they stick to the fabric and these are there's a few different brands but I think these are handy quilters little um, things meant for uh, you know, handy quilter makes them so that your long arm rulers don't slide but they work great on cutting rulers as well they're just little sticky things that you stick on um and so when you put it down i actually cut uh -huh. cut 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 so okay i don't i don't move the ruler i don't move the t-shirt i cut all the way around it before i move anything okay yeah that's good to know and i'm fine with you know using sashing too to kind of help with that as well so yeah, yeah. There. and these if anybody's interested um, are from a company called the Gadget Girls. Okay. Um, and they're a great company. You can buy just the one, one or two sizes that you want. Um, because I mean, like all rulers, they're not super cheap, but yeah. those are super handy. Um, there are some other pretty common sizes, I think like Missouri Star and quilting shops around here will carry. But if you know that you want an eight inch and a 14 inch, um, the Gadget Girls, you can go just order those two sizes. Okay, yeah, that's good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. I just sent an email, Denise, to you with the Vintage Soak website where you can order it. Hey, so we'll you could get all that, that sent out send tomorrow. Out the, Perfect. The presentation, that would be awesome. Thanks. I can do that. I can happy to do that. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question, please. Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm interested in the vintage soak also. I have some, I'll call them baby rompers from my husband and his twin sister. So they're pairs, boy and girl, um, probably about six months size. Any idea of how to incorporate them in a quilt? I really kind of hate to cut them apart, but I will slice them front to back. So I've seen if you if you Google it or go on Pinterest, there are some I think they're called clothesline quilts, mm -hmm. where the quilt has a clothesline going across it, and then it looks like the baby oh, rompers are hanging from the clothesline. Idea. So I I'm pretty sure I haven't made one, but I'm pretty sure they do cut the front and the back the part right, and yeah. then basically applique them down. What a cute a idea! Thank you. I've been yeah. looking at these for years trying to figure out what to do with them. <laughs> yeah, go look on Pinterest because there's a lot of options. And I, I think they call them clothesline quilts. I think you're right. Yes. Okay. Uh, Good idea. In regards to your, uh, those baby clothes, I have the little corduroy baby hat that was my mother's and she was born in 1928. And I put it in vintage soak and it did just fine. It okay, brightened good. up. It was the prettiest color of blue. So I don't think you're going to, you're not going to injure anything, any old vintage stuff with vintage soak. Okay, good idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey. Any other questions? Denise, this isn't a question, but will you have Libby tell about her program for next month before yes, we close? Please do. please do. And then we have a, a wheel as well. Is Libby still on? Is she on? Mm. Libby, Libby, Libby. Uh, her name is here. Oh, yeah. I just saw her unmute. She's coming. Yeah, there. Um, my present my presentation is in May. Yeah. Oh. I was gonna say, Mary, uh, this is Janie. My presentation is in April. Oh, okay. And I'm trying to move the calendar along. Okay, my presentation is on using all of those fancy decorative stitches you have on your machine that you never use if you're a quilter. And I've used mine for all kinds of things. So I'll have samples and I'll put together a PowerPoint like we did for tonight and uh, included 
I think, Denise, you've got the documentation already if you wanted to do a sampler type thing that would be very easy for you to do and get used to uh, messing with it, that all that information will be available to you guys. I have a question. Go right ahead. Okay, um, I have several uh, things that were passed down. I do not know for sure how old they are. I do know that um, at least a hundred years. Um, so one is a quilt that's not complete, um, but I'm wondering if I can do a whole quilt in that vintage soak. Um, I think some of the fabrics might fare well, but there are some that seem to be a little more thin. Uh, have you ever had to cut fabric out and re-put in, um, or does that mess up the quilt with it not being the same age fabric? I, I think it depends on what your expectations are. Okay. I can tell you that if you want to wash an entire top like that, yep. I would do it in vintage soak in a bathtub. Okay. And what I would do is I would first lay a big white sheet in the bathtub, fill it up with vintage soak and your water, and then lay your quilt top on top of that so that when you pull the quilt top out, when it's wet, it's supported. Okay. Once it's cleaned, as long as your pieces that are thin are not don't have holes and are not falling apart, literally, you're probably okay. All right. What you could do is you could just put a, like that SF 101 just behind that particular block or that area to reinforce it. Yeah, good idea. Um, so the, the book that I mentioned earlier of worth doing twice is, is an excellent resource Okay. for helping you walk through those things but with if you've got a top what my person that does my long arm quilting told me was that if it's hand piece which it may may well be um we just kind of have held it out like you were displaying the quilt to see you know if there were spots where you could literally see through that spot Mm -hmm. You need to do something, either remove that and replace it with another piece. What you may find is I have a quilt top that is hand pieced one inch squares that I haven't had finished yet because it's got some extra blocks. So the last row was never finished. So I'm going to take those extra blocks and take the pieces out of it to replace a few pieces Okay. in other areas of the quilt. Uh, where there's been damage to the fabric. Okay. So those are just some ideas. What I would do is I would take it to someone that is willing to do the long arming for you and have them and you look at it and really spread it out, press it really good, see how it's going to react, and then the long armor can help you determine is it, secure enough to put it under tension for the long arming. Heather, you've got experience with that, I think. Is that before the, the vintage soak or after the vintage soak? I would do that before. Oh, you would, okay. Yes, I would. Okay. The other thing I would do is, is lay it out on your floor and see how flat it lays um, before you start anything. I've done a few vintage tops for people um, that, you know, I had one lady bring me one and she said, I just want these so that I can, you know, do picnics on them. They were my, you know, grandma's and I don't sew and I, I don't care how beautiful it is. She just wanted it. She just wanted it usable and out of her, you know, linen chest. Um, but that particular quilt, when you looked at it had, it was, I think one inch squares and it had say 20. I mean, it wasn't 20, but we'll just use some, you know, it had 20 squares at the top and 30 in the middle and you know 15 <laughs> at the bottom because it was hand pieced and I think that particular one she said her grandma did it you know she started it at home and then she moved into the nursing home and her you know eyesight got bad so you know 
this thing was, it was not square. It was, and it was never going to lay flat, but she wasn't somebody who sewed or quilted. So she wasn't going to be able to fix it. And she didn't want to pay me to fix it for her. So we were able to make it work, but um, it's not what I would suggest for most people. The one thing that I have done on some of those older quilts is just like the t-shirts with the holes in them. If you feel like it's your background fabric that has a has gotten really thin um, and not you know a decorative fabric, you might just ask your long armor if they're willing to put a muslin fake top behind it. So you'd have your backing, your batting, your sheet of muslin, and then your top on top of it. So if some of those more threadbare areas do over time as you're using it, they might be good enough to quilt today, but you might look at it and say, boy, I don't know if I could even use this, right? But then you know that there's, there's something to keep that batting kind of stuck inside okay. in the long term. My last question is, um, it, it is, uh, it's a table, I don't know how to even describe it. Table runner. It's a table runner. It's, it's very old. Um, I'm just curious, got any ideas of what I could do with it? Well, I think, I think there's several things you could do with it. Uh, I also do weaving and spinning. So the fringe on it, there are methodologies of taking that fringe and straightening it out, ironing it. I'm assuming I'm looking at a cotton or a linen cotton fabric. So you could iron your fringe and straighten it out. And then there are techniques where you can uh, braid the fringe so that it would be smoother. Um, you could put it, just pillowcase it, put a backer on it, maybe put batting in it and just add quilting on top of it. So you could actually turn it into a quilted table runner and still have the fringe on it, or you could cut the fringe off if you don't want to deal with that and just put a backer on it and batting and maybe even uh, a binding on it and make a quilted top out of it. Depending on its size, if you were real inventive, you could turn it into a bag. Okay. So there's yeah. just some ideas. Okay. Not necessarily the right one, but. Thank you. The last question I had was I have old uh, quilt pieces that were cut by who knows in the family years ago. <laughs> would you also pre-soak those before you would do anything with them? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, th I mean, to me, anything that's been sitting you know, in a linen chest or, you know, in a sewing basket for 20, 30 years, I would definitely soak it. Yeah. And if you've got really small pieces, you could put them in a lingerie bag, a few in a lingerie bag at a time, so that when you're actually removing it from the vintage soak and you're rinsing it, they're kind of contained, they're not going to fray so badly. All right. Great, great questions. It's just it's kind of fun to hear all this. I have one more quick question. I'm sorry. Sure. I have some, a very, very old lace thing. And I didn't know what, what type of thread you would use when you're trying to fix the little places that are torn. I know, I know you would back it and all of that, but if, is there a particular kind of thread that you would use? Show it again. Hold uh, it. Is it tatted or crocheted? Can you I tell? Don't, That's what I'm trying um, to figure out. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. It looks like it's crocheted. Is it? It's so, um, I mean, some of them are so tiny, so I don't know. Well, there's, there's very, very, very fine crochet thread. And if you've got spots that have completely come apart, that could be a real challenge putting them back together. I'm not an expert on, on that particular topic, but one thing that you could do with it is you could uh, press it 
and put those places where it's come apart right next to each other and then uh, put it on a, a, a back, background or a backing mm -hmm. and then you could stitch it down from there and stitch where that little spot is that's torn apart to keep it together. If you're using the same color of thread in your bobbin and your sewing machine as to the color of the thread of the actual lace piece or crocheted piece, it's going to disappear and you're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter whether it's a, a, a cotton or a polyester thread? Uh, if that's old, it's cotton. Okay. And you can, you can always test what kind of fiber you have. Um, polyester, you take a match to it and it will melt if it has any kind of polyester in it. If it's a natural fiber, it will burn like cotton. Not necessarily that you want to burn any portion <laughs> of that, but uh, there are, and if you Google how to test what kind of fabric you've got, there are, there are methodologies of doing that. Thank you. The other thing you could do is to just embrace the, the broken pieces and just leave them broken. Yep. Sometimes that gives your piece character and kind of some history to it too. Yeah, it kind of tells the story of the piece, which is, which is wonderful. Yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, Mary Pacey, are you still here? Yes. Um, do you want to explain what um, our special drawing is? And I'll get it pulled up here. Okay. Um, I My family was the receiver of, of family treasures. And when a couple of uncles died while I was still working, I put the ties in a bag and I bought the book to do it. Well, probably 15 years later, when I started working on my dad's ties, uh, because he lived a lot longer, I found the book, but in the process, I bought a second book. So <laughs> there's a, a tie book to give away. And then someplace I was, and I don't exactly know if it was a cake, the state guild meeting, I got this hanker, this beautiful handkerchief on, uh, as a door prize or something. And Ken Dowry made my quilt, so I put that in for the prize bundle. All right. Well, the book and the handkerchief are at my office, so you can either pick it up at the extension office, or if you'd rather, I'd be happy to mail it to you if you would prefer that. You probably would have to email me your mailing address. Um, these were all the names of all the people that registered, and I pulled it off the, the internet this morning. Um, and when I spin this, if you're, if you're not here, then we're going to spin again because we want you to be here in order to claim your prize. Okay. So let's give this a spin. All right. Cynthia here tonight? I hope so, because I worked with her at the yes, IR. We're here. <laughs> OK. All right, Cynthia, congratulations. Um, you can either pick it up at my office or, or send me an email, and I'll mail it to you, OK? I'll stop by your office. OK, sounds wonderful. Let me get out of the screen. And um, go back to to uh, our meeting. So um, any other final questions or thoughts? I just wanna thank Heather and Janie and Mary for a great program. I know I have some pieces that um, you've kind of sparked some ideas in me. So um, hopefully I'll find some time to work on those this next month. And I'm looking forward to Janie's presentation on decorative stitches. Um, I know we all have these really great machines and we 
do not use them to their full capacity, that's for sure. So, um, Heather, anything else, Mary or Just Janie? Thanks. Anything? thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thank you. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you.